Willkommen in Berlin. Mein Name ist Markus Heinz, ich bin Rechtsanwalt aus Ulm und Mitbegründer von Querdenken 731. Neben mir sitzt Santa Dupuy, Robert F. Kennedy Jr., Tina Joy und Heiko Schöning von den Ärzten für Aufklärung. Wir sind hier heute in Berlin, um die Mitglieder von Children's Health Europe und Children's Health Amerika von den Vereinigten Staaten zu begrüßen. Und Robert Kennedy Jr. ist nach Berlin gekommen, um hier mit Children's Health Europe mehrere Termine abzuhalten. Und das ist jetzt heute unser Einf Anfangstreffen. Und ich würde dann direkt an den Heiko Schöning übergeben. Und dann kannst du ein paar Sachen noch in Englisch sagen und unsere Gäste nochmal auf Englisch begrüßen. Ja. Yeah. Herzlichen Dank für die Einführung. Hello and welcome to Berlin. This is Friday, the 28th of August, 2020. Well, a great welcome to this uh, conference here. We have a great guest. My name is Heiko Schöning. I'm a medical doctor and I'm the, the co-founder of Doctors for Enlightenment, Ärzte für Aufklärung. So we are very pleased to have Robert F. Kennedy here in Berlin and with uh, his colleagues from the uh, Organization for Children's Health. They will speak to you just there in a minute. So we are here, um, very, uh, we are very pleased to have him here. So as you know, he is a nephew of the man who, sp uh, who spoke the words, uh, Ich bin ein Berliner. And he, they will tell you what they are going to do here in this historic place and in this historic times. Please. I am Robert F. Kennedy Jr. Excuse my voice, <coughs> which should get better as I talk. And let me explain to you a little bit about the journey that brought me here. I run the biggest water protection group in the world. It's called Waterkeeper Alliance. And back in the early 2000s, I was suing big coal burning power plants in the United States for discharging mercury. At that time, and my only concern was the impact of the mercury on fish and on human health of the human beings who ate the fish. Around that time, it came to my attention that there was also large amounts of mercury in vaccines, much larger exposures to children than any child would ever get from eating fish. And so we began to, I began to address that and we started an organization that was trying to have a very limited scope, which was trying to remove the mercury from vaccines. Little by little, I came to understand that there were larger problems with vaccines and the central problem and the one we were most deeply concerned with was that vaccines in the United States were not safety tested. They have an exemption that is not available to any other medical product. And that exemption, which most people cannot even believe, is an artifact of CDC's legacy as the public health service, which was a quasi-military agency. And in the, at the time that the vaccine system, the vaccine program was launched, the purpose was a national defense purpose. And they wanted to make sure that vaccines could be quickly formulated and deployed in order to derail attacks by foreign countries of bio, with biological substances. So they removed the regulatory impediments, including the necessity to test vaccines, to safety test vaccines against placebos. And so my very narrow purpose in starting the children's health defense was to address this problem and get vaccines properly safety tested. Because if they're not safety tested, nobody can tell you with any medical authority whether that vaccine is injuring more people than it's saving. And yet, as we continued on with this advocacy, it became very clear that there were other problems as well. Uh, there was problems with the corruption in our political system. 
the pharmaceutical companies had not only corrupted our politicians with huge amounts of lobbying money, they had captured the agencies that are supposed to protect Americans from public health threats, the CDC, the FDA, the HHS. They had captured the press in our country. A huge influx of advertising dollars, which had neutralized the press, and they had effectively subverted American democracy by neutralizing all of those institutions that the founding fathers of our nation had created to stand between a greedy corporation and a vulnerable child. The Congress had been corrupted. The regulatory agencies were captured. They had become sock puppets for the industry they were supposed to regulate. The press had been sidelined. And worst of all, they had passed a law in our country in 1986 that gave pharmaceutical companies complete immunity from liability. So there was no incentive for any of those companies to make vaccines safe. And little by little, we recognized that this was not just an American issue. This was a global issue. I came two years ago when I was arguing the Monsanto case, and I met my partner here, Santa Dupuy. And Santa already understood the connection that had taken me so long to formulate between toxics in our environment the capture of our agencies and our political structures by those powerful com companies. Uh, she also recognized that pharmaceutical companies were the most powerful, more powerful than oil, more powerful than the chemical industry, and a greater threat not only to our children's health, but to all the institutions of democracy, not in the United States, but all around the globe. And I'm very glad that Tina Choi helped Santa to organize Children's Health Defense Europe. We are here today to announce, to launch the beginning of this organization. Uh, we've been very, very successful in the United States. Uh, we recognize that the pharmaceutical industry is, uh, is operating and capturing politicians and running governments in every nation on the globe. And if we win this battle just in one nation, the United States, we're still going to lose it globally. So we need people of goodwill, people who have courage, people who have a, a, a nonconformist way of thinking, who understand that we are being lied to, that the entire political structure today is, uh, is saturated in pharmaceutical propaganda. And we have watched over the past few years something that is extraordinary. We are at an inflection point, I believe, in human history. The largest and most critical inflection point that human, humanity has ever encountered. For many years, totalitarian and authoritarian states have used the power of fear to engineer compliance in populations. I grew up understanding what happened in World War II in our country. And during the Nuremberg trials, Hermann Goering was asked by the prosecutor, how did you make the German people comply? And Goering said, it's not just Germany. This works in any country, whether it's a fascist country, or a communist country, or a monarchy, or a democracy, all the rulers need to do is to tell people that there's something they need to be fear fearful of, to point a finger at that source of their fear, and you can make human beings do anything you want. You can make them go to slaughter like sheep. You can make them obey. During the same Great Depression, that spawned Adolf Hitler. We were very lucky in our country that we had a leader, Franklin Roosevelt. And he said, the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. He understood that fear would drive us into totalitarianism. Well, the biosecurity agenda that people like Bill Gates and Anthony Fauci and Davos 
and all of these people who are running now the global economy, they have understood for years that they have a power that no totalitarian government has ever had available to it, which is the biosecurity. You know, in, in Hitler could point at the Jews and say, those are the big threat. We need to be frightened of them. And you guys, everybody else needs to obey so that we can fight them off. Other countries were scared of the Bolsheviks. In the United States, you know, our demagogues point to the Mexicans or dark-skinned people and say, we need to be scared of them, or terrorists. And, you know, all of those things get us to voluntarily give, us, give up, relinquish our human rights, our civil rights, and walk like sheep into the abattoir. But now they have a source of fear that is the most pervasive and all-encompassing power that they've ever had, which is the fear of pandemics. Governments love pandemics the same way that they love wars, because it gives them power, it gives them, the, it gives them control, and it gives them the capacity to, to impose obedience on human beings. And today we have an inflection of new technologies that give governments the capacity to impose controls on populations that have never been imagined before in human history by any tyrant in history. We have 5G, which has created a surveillance state. 5G is not here for your benefit. It's not here so that you can, it's gonna make your life better because you can download your video game in six seconds rather than 29. The only reason for 5G is because it allows these big data companies run by Bill Gates and Mark Zuckerberg and Jeffrey Bezos to harvest our data, to listen to your conversations on your cell phone. They've always been able to do that, but there was no way for them to transport that data, to subject it to analytics, and then to monetize it and to, and to sell it. Bill Gates today is building a city in Arizona, 80,000 people with a data center that will be able to take all of this new data, the data on your Alexis in your home. You think that Alexis is working for you? Alexis isn't working for you. She is spying on you. Your cell phone is spying on you. They have biometric facial recognition systems, your GPS. All the satellites that Bill Gates brags that his satellites will be able to monitor every square inch of the planet 24 hours a day. They're gonna know, and then they have another innovation, which is digital currency. And once they have digitalized our currency and gotten rid of the cash economy, they have absolute control over us because they'll be able to tax every transaction. The banks will be able to, uh, to cash in on every transfer of, of wealth, every transaction, no matter how minuscule, no matter how small, but also they'll be able to enforce obedience. Because if you're disobedient, they'll be able to shut down your bank account and starve you. And you'll have no access to cash. And many people argue that this pandemic was a pandemic that it was planned from the outset, that it's part of a sinister scheme. I can't tell you the answer to that. I don't have enough evidence. A lot of it feels very planned to me, but I don't know. But I will tell you this. If you create these mechanisms for control, they become weapons of obedience for authoritarian regimes, no matter how beneficial or innocent the people who created them once you create them, they will be abused. 100% guarantee that they will be abused. And all of the people who are out on the street now, who are arguing with, these, with this new imposition that we're seeing all around us, of authoritarian control, of people being told, wear your mask. And you know, I think everybody in Europe 
everybody in Germany, everybody in the United States, if they were told, here's why you should wear a mask, here's the science that says it, it will help, here is the science that says it works, that you will stop transmission to other people, everybody would wear it with no problem. What we know is that we're not being dealt with honestly. We're being told, this is the science. But it's not, it's, peop it's, the si it's an appeal to authority. It's science because Tony Fauci and Bill Gates tell us it's science. We want to see the studies. We want to see the studies on hydroxychloroquine. We want to see the studies on whether the lockdown is killing more people than the coronavirus. We want to see real science and real risk assessments. And we are not going to take the word my father told me when I was a child. People in authority lie. And we all, if we are going to continue to live in a democracy, we need to understand that people in authority lie. People in authority will abuse every power that we relinquish to them. And right now, we are giving them the power to micromanage every bit of our lives 24 hours a day. They're going to know where we are. They're going to know the money that we spend. They're going to have access to our children. They're going to have the right to f compel unwanted medical interventions on us. We, you know, the Nazis did that in the camps in World War II. They tested vaccines on gypsies and Jews. And the world was so horrified after the war that we signed the Nuremberg Charter. And we all pledged when we do that. We would never again impose unwanted medical interventions on human beings without informed consent. And yet in two years, all of that conviction has suddenly disappeared. And people are walking around in mass where the science has not been explained to them. They are, they are doing what they're told. They are orchestrating, these, these government agencies are orchestrating obedience. And it is not democratic. It's not the product of democracy. It's the product of a pharmaceutical driven biosecurity agenda that will enslave the entire human race and plunge us into a dystopian nightmare where the apocalyptical forces of ignorance and greed will be running our lives and ruining our children and destroying all the dreams and dignity that we hope to give to our children. And the launch of this organization, Children's Health Defense in Europe, is a beachhead it's an announcement to the world that we are not going to take it. We are building institutions to fight your institutions. And you have global institutions, and we now have a global institution. And we are going to be out tomorrow with the biggest crowd in German history, and they're all going to be saying peacefully the same thing. We are not going to let you take our democracy away. We are not going to let you take our health away. We are not going to let you take our freedoms away. We are not going to let you take our children away. And I'm very proud of the people that I'm sitting at this table with, who are people who have the courage to challenge, to speak truth to power, and to think independently and to break away from the orthodoxies that are enslaving so much of the human race. Thank you. Thank you very Please. much, Mr. Okay. Chairman. Yeah, if I can speak to my name is Sinta de Poet. I'm uh, from uh, Belgium. And um, Perhaps just also a few words. When we met, it was at the European uh, Parliament. And Belgium, you know, is a small country, but at the heart of the European Union. And so, yes, from experience, I've been, you know, after my personal experience with vaccine, vaccine injury, I started to um, 
question the science and the decisions that were made and try to lobby a little the European institutions. And it was very obvious to me that in all countries we could see the same strategies happening, the same narrative, the same science, the same kind of legislation, uh, always in synchronous, so synchronous, let's say, simultaneously uh, deployed in uh, Europe, and also how big actually the influence of the United States was on European policies, and especially of, uh, uh, let's say, the, the American lobbies. Um, so this is not only for vaccines, it is also the case for uh, you know, the Roundup, pesticides and other uh, harms. So um, it was very clear to me already that we had an international agenda that was being deployed everywhere without even really paying attention to, what, to the, the reality of what is happening into all of our countries. And so um, I try to, yes, let's say, collaborate with different uh, countries in Europe. And today I'm very happy that we can uh, finally open up a European branch of children's health defense. Because I think in Europe, each of our country, each country has a specific contribution that they can make. The Italians, for example, have done excellent research on many issues. Uh, the French also, you know, for, um, for each issue, uh, every country might, ha might have a great scientist, a new research, um, something, a whistleblower, some new information or some kind of action of activism that uh, they, can, they can show and contribute. And so when I also see the whole work that has been done fantastic in the United States, how the organization of um, Robert F. Kennedy Jr. is really leading to the a movement not only on health safety, but also increasingly on uh, health freedom and human rights, because this is where gradually moving from uh, uh, issues of health safety and regulation to real issues of human rights. And I can think of also, for example, of lately, um, the litigation against censorship on, on, against Facebook, we are concerned by all those issues that, let's say, will add up to the, the first one that we were concerned with. And I really believe that together, all together today with the inspiration, let's say, that uh, Mr. Kennedy uh, can give us and the power of the actions that they are doing in uh, the United States, and also in each of our countries that we can really um, provide today uh, also, let's say, an international answer or create a real alliance to stand up for our rights and for our freedoms and to refuse what is going on at the moment. Thank so you, Santa. Thank I would like to thank you. I just say, um, voilà, pour les, uh, les personnes qui nous regardent en français, euh, vraiment l'organisation va essayer d'être euh, euh, européenne donc il y aura beaucoup de contenus qui seront traduits euh, euh, en français anche per gli italiani che saluto adesso voglio dire che questa organizzazione sarà veramente euh, europea e vogliamo euh, agire tutti insieme anche fare la traduzione fra poco apriremo veramente un website e potremmo condividere tutte le nostre informazioni. Uh, yes, yeah, so I would like now to introduce you to uh, Tina Choi, who is our German representative of Children's Health Defense Europe. And uh, perhaps let her speak. I am very personally very, very impressed by the reaction of the German people, and I must say that as a European, I am very proud of being in Germany today. I think the Germans can make the difference in history. They have the consciousness that we all need, and they have the courage to manifest, you know, the, what they want, you know, to stand up for their rights today. So, 
Congratulations to Germany. Thank you for leading us today. Danke, Sandra. Vielen Dank. Und vielen Dank, Mr. Kennedy. Um, ich kann mich nur anschließen. Um, wir sind sehr, sehr glücklich, dass wir uns an diesem Wochenende in Berlin befinden und um, dass wir die Children's Health Defense Europe, die Unterorganisation von der Children's Health Defense USA, heute um, eröffnen können. Morgen und übermorgen haben wir ein Meeting. Und dazu haben wir Mr. Kennedy nach Deutschland eingeladen. Und er ist gekommen und wir sind so glücklich, dass es geklappt hat. Und ja, vielen Dank, Mr. Kennedy, dass Sie hier sind. Thank you so much for being here. It's our great honor to have you and to open up the new chapter of Children's Health Defense Europe together with you and Mary Holland. Thank you. Okay, yeah. Thank you. I have some technical remarks. So this, this conference will be broadcast at www.acu2020.org. It will be translated into 10 languages. Um, you can find uh, other contents on this website as well. Plus, uh, I'm here in Germany acting as a medical doctor of uh, Robert Kennedy, and I just would like to announce his voice is not related to any uh, virus or something. He has not COVID-19 something. It's a long-lasting physical voice disease, just, just to say this. So he is... Um, His health is very intact, and we are proud to have him here with us. So tomorrow there will be um, a very big crowding, like in the 1st of August. This was the biggest in Europe, and tomorrow it's going to be much bigger, because we are standing here all together to try to tell the truth to the people. And I'm very pleased that, uh, that we're here, that we're standing together internationally for health, especially for children. I'm a father as well, and I don't want that my, uh, that my sons will suffer in the future, and I don't want to be asked by them, by my sons, hey, daddy, are you too chicken or too stupid at this time? Yeah. You gave all the remarks what we have in the 1930s here. Yeah. Um, I don't want to comment on this, but we have very special times. I agree with you, and we need to stand up and tell the truth. So thank you very much. Yeah, um, maybe a few words from me. Michael Balbeck invited you to the big protest tomorrow and you already said that uh, you're coming. We are very pleased that you're coming because we're a big, big movement for, for freedom, for peace. And I think this is a very strong signal to the world. First of all, that you now have Children's Health Europe because we have a lot of problems with um, children's rights right now in Germany. We can talk about this later and we will talk about it in, in some meeting in the next days. So we are very pleased to have you here. It's absolutely fantastic. And I think we can change the world with that, what we are doing this weekend in Berlin. And so I'm happy to have you here. Maybe you can say some words in Germany. Yes. Berlin, Berlin, wir fahren nach Berlin. <lacht> Berlin, Berlin, wir fahren nach Berlin. Berlin, Berlin, wir fahren nach Berlin. <lacht>